I'm Alex Rosemary, a surgeon here at Florida Hospital Tampa in practice with Dr. Sharona Ross. On behalf of Dr. Ross, I want to talk about reflux disease. The intent of this is to cover a lot of issues so that you're able to look at this, learn about this, and make the time you spend with us more, more uh, efficient for you so you get more out of this. This will help raise some questions you'll want to ask us, and it will give you a more thorough understanding, I think, of what reflux is all about. This is something you can look at, you can look at again and again, and it's something you can show your family, like, what did Rock Dr. Ross, what did Dr. Roseberg say in the office? You can say, well, in part, they told me this, and you can show them this, and we'll make this available to you uh, through the internet. Ask about that as well. But what I want to talk to you about is just in general terms is about gastroesophageal reflux. Now, I'm going to give this as a general talk. This is generic general talk. And so I'm going to make some assumptions that you have a problem like most people. But part of the evaluation process is to determine exactly that. What is your specific problem and what is your physiology? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this. And then I'm going to talk, after I do that, I'm going to talk about treatment first. I'm going to put the cart before the horse. We're going to talk about treatment. And then, then we're going to talk about the workup. And then we're going to talk about how the workup can show us things that will change the treatment. But i got to start somewhere, so I'm going to talk about treatment. Okay, so here we go. Most people who have gastroesophageal reflux disease have some of their stomach and their chest called a hiatal hernia. Now, a hiatal hernia in and of itself does not denote some disease state. It's just a finding, an anatomic finding. And the term hiatal hernia was introduced into the lexicon of the United States and Americans in the 1950s, and it somehow it got to be considered a disease. But if someone told me they have a hiatal hernia, that does not denote to me a disease. More than half the people over age 50 have a hiatal hernia. So if someone says, I have a hiatal hernia, that doesn't tell me anything. I'd say, so, because it's not a disease or a disorder. But in some people that have hiatal hernias, they have bad gastroesophageal reflux. So here's the diaphragm here, and here is some of the stomach, and some of this stomach here is above the diaphragm. That's the hiatal hernia, right here. Okay, so when we operate on people, we make a small incision in their belly button, and the reason we do that is because it's scarless. It minimizes pain, because it's just one incision instead of many, and it gives a better cosmetic outcome. And while Maybe a cosmetic outcome is not important for everybody. It's import very important for some, and I think at some level it is important for everybody because patients will judge, just like everybody else, patients will judge the contents of a package by the appearance of the package. And we do elegant surgery. We do. And because of that, I think you're going to feel better about the operation you had. I think you're going to feel good about the healthcare choice you made. Because you have the opportunity to have many different people take care of you. But we want you to know that we think by coming to us, you're going to receive the best health care you can. Certainly the best health care we can provide. So this, this anatomy is generally what people have. And when we make that small incision, the first thing that we do is we reduce all this back into the abdomen and then it looks more like it does in the books, where the stomach comes down like this. I mean, the esophagus comes down like this, this esophagus, and the stomach looks like this. And then you have this hole here that allowed, that's what allowed the stomach to get up in here. This is the diaphragm and the opening, the aperture, the opening in the diaphragm where the esophagus goes through is just too big. And that's what allowed the stomach to get up in there. Ultimately, we're gonna fix this. But now what we do at this point is we come along here and we free up the stomach. So that's very floppy. And then we come over to the, this area and where the stomach is tethered. And we make a small incision in the tissue that tethers the stomach. And we reach through here with an instrument. And all that instrument do, does is grab. It's not a fancy instrument. It's just an instrument. And what it does, it grabs. What we do is we grab the back wall of your stomach and we pull it through this window. And now this is how it's going to look. 
Here's your esophagus. Here's your stomach. And your stomach has now been pulled through that little window. And so you've got some of the back of your stomach over here. <coughs> then we're going to put a suture from here to here to here, from here to here to here, and that's going to cause this to fold over your, the stomach to fold over your esophagus, and then it's going to look like this. Like that. Now there's your new valve mechanism. This is a valve mechanism, and this is how a Nissen fundoplication would look. And we're going to back that area where you have the big hole in the diaphragm, and we're going to put place sutures in here like this. To make that snug but not tight around your esophagus. So it may well be when we start that the defect or the aperture, the hole, if you will, the opening in your diaphragm is big like this, and the esophagus could just roll around in there easy. But when we're done, we will close that snug but not tight around your esophagus as in this picture. Now there's eight things that everybody gets after this operation, and these eight things are really important for you to know about so that you're not surprised. <coughs> The eight things are, and I'll go through these twice. Number one, you're going to get shoulder pain that is a consequence of the carbon dioxide you insufflate your, your, your belly with. When you blow up a balloon or you insufflate a balloon, it gets bigger. Well, we do the same with your belly so we have space to work. And so that's number one. That irritates the diaphragms, you'll sense that as shoulder pain. Number one, shoulder pain. Two, Food will catch at your new valve mechanism, so you go home on pudding, applesauce, and yogurt, soft stuff. You'll work towards a regular diet. You'll get a printed diet sheet. Three, you'll get bloated from air you swallow. People with bad reflux swallow a lot of air. And they swallow air because they learn subconsciously that if they dry swallow like this, that it, it, it causes their esophagus to contract and clear the reflux material from their esophagus. So they dry swallow a lot, and that's how the air gets in there, so they get bloated. And with that, then they start to pass more gas, and they have more bowel movements per week. Not diarrhea exactly, just defecatory frequency or more bowel movements per week. They have some nausea, probably from the air in their stomach. They get full quickly when they eat, probably because they have lost a little bit of reservoir function, plus their stomach's got air in it. And number eight is they'll have pain at their belly button. And that should last a week, 10 days, something like that, to ever decreasing amount. Now, given that this is what we do, how do we work people up for this problem? Well, there's two things we need to know. We need to know how good a valve to construct, and we need to know what is the anatomy. So you'll get an upper GI study where you drink some contrast, and, uh, and they'll look at your esophagus, and they'll see how the contrast goes through your, down your esophagus into your stomach. As well, we will give you, a, uh, uh, or you will bring with you, a campfire-sized marshmallow. Bring a few of them. Uh, in case you drop one or something, I guess. But, but bring along some campfire-sized marshmallows, and they'll have you take a bite of it and then drink some contrast while you're in a head-down position. Same with a bagel. They'll have you take a bite of a bagel, head-down position, and we'll see how you clear the bagel and the marshmallow in a head-down position. That's against two gradients, the gradient of gravity, and also going from the high pressure abdomen to the low pressure chest, we want to make sure how your, uh, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Going from the low pressure chest to the high pressure abdomen, we want to make sure that your esophagus can push food up that gradient. So it's against gravity and then against the pressure that is higher in your abdomen than in your chest, against that pressure gradient, you'll have to clear the food bolus against those two gradients. And so then the issue is how many, how many times did your esophagus contract? Now the way it normally works is somebody would eat something, their esophagus would contract, the sphincter mechanisms would open up, food drops in and it closes. And, and uh, in your case, we need to know how many stripping motions did it take to clear it? Did it take one or did it take two to clear the, mo the, the, the marshmallow or bagel? Did it take three? Or did it, did, the, did it go down and come back and forth a little to and fro activity? Those kinds of answers will be very important in knowing what kind of a valve to make. 
For example, if the motility in your, in your esophagus is not very good, we would change this. Instead of it being a complete fundopligation, it would be like this. And you can see here that there's now a runway or a level of separation between the, between the stomach brought around from behind and the front of the stomach that's brought here. Now the way we construct that is by not putting the sutures in exactly like this. In this circumstance, we would get it set up like this, and we put a suture from here to here, and from here to here, and from here to here. And on this side, we put it from here to here, and 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 then this would look like that. And the, the first one was a Nissen fundoplication, and this is a toupee fundoplication. It may also be that depending upon like this, your, what your upper GI looks like and what your Bravo pH study looks like, that we might be able to do uh, a, a corrective procedure through your mouth. In that case, that it would look very much different than this. But I want you to know that that's an option that may be available to us. It depends upon the presence or absence of a hiatal hernia in particular and to what the clearance mechanisms look like on the Bravo pH study. So this is, I want you to know what the basic anatomy is. I want you to understand what the options are. It's a laparoscopic with a single incision laparoscopic approach. So we call that a laparoscopic single site. The acronym is LESS. Laparoscopic, excuse me, a laparoendoscopic single site approach, a LESS approach. So it'd be a less Nissen fundoplication or a less toupee fundoplication. And then the other options would be to do this endoscopically to either cause a radio frequency therapy to be applied to your sphincter mechanism in this area. Or we might be able to, by the use of some polypropylene or plastic H fasteners, we might be able to plicate or fix your stomach to your esophagus in such a way that, you are developed, that you'll have a very good anti-reflux valve constructed through your mouth. So the point is, is that this is the basic anatomy that affects everybody, but some people are different. Some of you don't have hyalur hernias, for example. Given that our people have different kinds of anatomy, we base the therapy uh, on, the, on the differing anatomies. Not everybody gets the same operation. So we need to do the upper GI and the pH study to know what you've got and then given what you've got, then we're going to talk with you about the therapy that we think would be the most efficacious, effective, efficacious, the most efficacious and, the, and the, uh, with the least pain and suffering and recovery and, and those things. So, uh, and, and also there'll be issues, differences with cosmetic outcome. Though we do single incision approach, which is basically scarless. Best scar, of course, is one you never get. And, it, with that in mind, an endoscopic approach would have no scar. So we, we, uh, we, uh, we provide efficacious care, reliable, durable care, with minimal amount of pain and suffering by our different approaches, and we're going to tailor make our approach for what your problem is. So with this backdrop, then I look forward to questions you might have, or Dr. Ross would be happy to answer them as well and talking to you about your problem and then working through this process with you. When you're in the office, you will be asked to sign a consent form for a research trial. The research trial you're being asked to sign up for is really very simple. It's just to follow you. People who have gastroesophageal reflux disease and other swallowing disorders, we keep track of them. So <coughs> if you ask me how our patients have done, I have a pretty good answer because we spend a incredible amount of time and effort in following our patients. Similarly, we will want to follow you. And so we're going to be get, you're going to be getting contact letters from us basically every summer to find out how you're doing it through a host of different symptoms and in terms of your body image. So we'll see how you, you and you'll get those forms today to fill out. It'll be then going forward in the years to come more of those forms. As well, after the operation's over, probably near one year, maybe three to five years, and then say seven to ten years, we're going to want to restudy you with another anti <laughs> We're going to want to restudy you with another pH study or measure of acid reflux. And the reason for that is, is that we might alter your symptoms 
but you could still have silent reflux at some level. And we want to know so that you don't, in some insidious, unseen way, you would injure your esophagus. So we want to prevent any type of insidious, quiet, unbeknownst type of injury that you might incur because you no longer have symptoms from your reflux, but you still have some reflux. In other words, we need to diagnose whether or not you're having silent reflux. And certainly if you have symptoms in whatever time period that we would continue to follow you for forever and ever, basically. If you develop symptoms, we would want to work that up because it is possible that for whatever reason that you would fail your operation. Now, who fails these things? Well, there's three high-risk groups. Uh, older women that look a little bit like Aunt B, if you remember the Andy Griffith show. They have a real frail skin you can almost see through. And as a consequence of their healing abilities, their tissue does not hold a stitch very well. And I worry about patients like that. Number two would be people who get involved in rapid deceleration injuries where they get a huge blow to the stomach. I mean, you're going to say, well, this isn't many people, and it's not. But people who get involved in motor vehicle accidents, people who get involved in falls or some kind of injury trauma, theoretically someone who gets kicked by a horse. You would say that doesn't happen very much, but you operate on a few thousand people, people get in car accidents and it happens. And then the third one would be young men who are really involved in weightlifting, men in particular, but it could be a woman as well. And they get involved in weightlifting and they generate a really high intra-abdominal pressure when they push those weights. It could also be for someone who's involved in some type of work activity where they're really lifting heavy things like 50-gallon uh, drums or bags of concrete or bags of fertilizer and doing really heavy work because every time they pick something up or they pull on something or lift something and they go Ooh! like that with a grunt like that, that's called a Valsalva maneuver and that increases the intra-abdominal pressure and given enough time and enough repetition, enough heavy stuff, it is possible to break down this area where this reconstruction has been done. And so, is it really worth it to move that couch? I'll leave that to you. But after the operation's over, I'm going to ask that you be reasonable in terms of picking up suitcases, moving couches, throwing cinder blocks around the backyard, whatever it might be. Just be prudent. And remember, it's oftentimes a lot less expensive in the long run to hire a high school kid to help you around the yard than it is to do it yourself. Hurt your back and something like that. It's not worth it. So just, just consider that as a, as, a, as a thought. I look forward to seeing you in the office. We'll talk more about this. You'll meet Dr. Ross, you'll meet me, uh, and, uh, and we'll work through this process. But any questions you have, write them down, and we'll get through this for you. Thank you very much.